or speed to kill their prey. Our ancestors had neither. Today, we are on top of the food chain, so it's hard to imagine the predicament of those early humans. Here was a slow-moving creature with no claws or fangs, easy prey for the hungry predators around him. This is a fossil forehead and brow ridge of a Homo erectus. And on the brow ridge, you can see the bite mark of a carnivore. Well, this reminds us that these Homo erectus individuals weren't at the top of the food chain. So how did Turkana boy, a weakling with a big brain which needed calories, get his meat? Homo erectus faced a problem. How do you kill a big dangerous animal that has lots of meat and fat in it? without that animal also killing you. I think the answer to that was a very clever set of innovations, and that is endurance running and high activity in the middle of the day. The ancestors of Homo erectus, small, hairy apes like Lucy, were bipedal, but probably didn't do much running. But Turkana boy's kind were built to run, like us. Yeah. This is an accelerator. Dan Lieberman believes they could run long distances because, like us, they had lost their thick coat of body hair and could keep cool by sweating. This was the key to their success. But how do we know if these crucial changes go back all the way to Turkana Boy's time over a million years ago? Skin and hair are rarely preserved in the fossil record, so to find out, we have to look to a creature that's been intimately connected with hair for a long time, the louse. All animals seem to have some type of lice to parasitize them. Mammals have them, birds have them, even fish have types of lice. But most other creatures have only one type of lice to parasitize them. Humans have one kind of louse on their heads and another in the pubic area. Geneticist Mark Stoneking asked himself why. The answer that seems obvious is that when we had body hair all over our bodies, we had one type of lice, but then we became hairless until we only had hair on our heads and in our pubic region. And so therefore, you would have this hairless geographic barrier to contact between the two. Mark was surprised to find out that the human pubic louse is very different from the human head louse. Somehow, in the past, it seems to have come from gorillas because the pubic lice that is actually more closely related to gorilla lice. Now, how it is our ancestors got pubic lice from gorillas, I wouldn't care to speculate. But nonetheless, one needs gorilla lice in order to really work this whole thing out. The most likely scenario is that when we lost our body hair, the original human louse migrated to our heads, leaving the pubic area temporarily unpopulated by lice. When our ancestors had contact with gorillas, perhaps sleeping in their nests or scavenging their bodies for meat, the gorilla louse colonized their pubic region. Eventually, it turned into the human pubic louse of today. So if we could find out when the human pubic louse and the gorilla louse diverged, we would have a rough idea of when we lost our body hair. Fortunately, there's a way to figure that out. The genetic dating technique known as the molecular clock. It's based on the fact that the sequence of chemical bases which make up DNA mutate at a regular rate. It's just a very simple idea that the rate of change in DNA sequences is more or less constant over time. And that means that you have a way of determining when two species last shared a common ancestor. By counting the number of differences in the genetic code of two species, scientists can determine how long they've been evolving away from each other. When Mark used the molecular clock, to count the differences between the DNA of gorilla lice and human pubic lice, he came up with a date for their divergence. The estimated date for the divergence is roughly three million years ago. That means long before Turkana boy, maybe even around Lucy's time, our ancestors 
had slowly begun to lose their body hair. Turkana boy was mostly hairless, just like us. And that may be what gave him an edge over other predators. Most animals are at a disadvantage in the midday sun because they overheat. They can only cool down by panting. And when they run fast, they can't pant. That means they can only run in short sprints. Quadrupeds can gallop for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then they overheat. But hominids can cool down by sweating. They use their entire body like a, like a dog's tongue. Our hairless bodies allow air to circulate freely on our skin and cool us down as sweat evaporates. This makes us one of the best long-distance runners in the animal kingdom. Dan Lieberman believes this gave our ancestors the ability to hunt in a very unusual way. It's called persistence hunting. And he believes the modern ethnographic record can show us how it was done. The Bushmen of the Kalahari offer us an insight into how Homo erectus might have hunted two million years ago. The Bushmen know that at midday, animals rest in the shade, which is why it's the perfect time to be hunting. Once they locate their prey, in this case, a kudu, the marathon begins. Their strategy is simple, run it to exhaustion. Every time the animal tries to rest, the hunters track it down and get it moving again. They never give it a chance to cool down. And the reason they can keep going is that they can sweat. So if the theory is right, the Bushman hunt may help explain how Turkana boy got his meat. Homo erectus had come up with an innovative way of feeding his hungry brain. In this modern hunt, the Bushmen ran in the fierce heat for over four hours. The kudu was finally immobilized by heat stroke. Turkana boy wouldn't have had steel-tipped spears like the Bushmen, but he wouldn't have needed them. Erectus probably hunted with close quarters weapons, with spears that were thrown at animals from a short distance, clubs, thrown rocks, weapons like that. They weren't using long distance projectile weapons that we know of. The Homo erectus hunt was simple but effective. It fed not just their larger brains, but the growing complexity of that early human society. There are other social animals, but none quite like us. Society is in every corner of our lives. Our relationships, communication, rules, symbolism, all the things that bind us together. What's behind it? Why do we become so social? Could it have something to do with another innovation, something unprecedented in our evolution, building fires and cooking. Here we got erect as the first species that looks like us. And I think only cooking can explain the magnitude of this change. The earliest evidence that our ancestors deliberately used fire for cooking dates to long after Turkana boy's time. But Richard Wrangham is sure Homo erectus was building fires much earlier. Now for the first time we had a species that was committed to living on the ground because they lose their climbing adaptations. Well, how were they sleeping? They had to be able to protect themselves from wild animals. On the African savanna, full of predators who hunt by night, Richard believes Turkana boy and his people 
couldn't have survived without fire. And he thinks only cooking, which makes food more soft and digestible, can explain why Homo erectus evolves smaller teeth and a much smaller gut. These things are compatible with the reduced cost of digestion produced by cooking food. Nothing else is. As our ancestors reaped the benefits of cooking, something else happened too. At least according to Wrangham. We became more social. Humans have this wonderfully calm temperament compared to chimpanzees, say. Where did it come from? We were drawn to a common place, the fireplace.